Well, hello everybody and welcome back. Welcome to part two of our little uh, x-ray video series, um, part two of two. And we're going to talk a little bit more technically about how an x-ray tube works. Um, so, in order to understand how one of these works, you really have to first go back and understand how a vacuum tube in general works. And um, we can we can go all the way back to the most basic vacuum tube there is. And uh, let me show you here. Here's your most basic vacuum tube. And yes, it's the light bulb. And uh, let me give you a little sidebar on this one. If you take a look at this bulb, um, look at the end, it says traffic sign. I know that uh, these high wattage filament uh, light bulbs, incandescent bulbs, are kind of getting phased out in the world because of energy savings, which is a great thing. But uh, for us electronics guys, it's getting harder and harder to find good bulbs for our dim bulb testers that we use. Any of you who are into electronics know what a dim bulb tester is. But uh, this is a really good idea. You can still purchase these online and most electrical supply houses sell these. And what these are, is these are traffic signal lights. Now the nice thing about a traffic signal light is they're 116 watts, so they're high wattage. They have very heavy duty filaments. They have about eight times the life of a standard 100 watt light bulb and they're very durable. They're designed for all weather and so forth. So this is about the best bulb you can get for a dim bulb tester. So uh, just a little, a little tip there for you guys. So anyways, this, is, this was kind of where it all started. And I, we all know the story of Thomas Edison and the light bulb. And, you know, so some things, some of the stories are just, you know, legends. And some are, there's truth as well. But the bottom line is, this is an evacuated and glass envelope. It's sealed and, and it has a vacuum in it. Um, there's a tungsten filament. And that filament lights up. And the main purpose for all of this was we just wanted a way to get that filament to glow very, very hot so it could give off light. And really the light was the thing that we wanted from this. And so after a lot of experimenting, Mr. Edison and, and his team found that if they used a tungsten filament in an evacuated glass envelope like this, a clear glass envelope, it would give off a very nice shade, a nice color of uh, soft white light. And it was very bright and uh, very efficient for what for the day, obviously. But there were some things that he noticed early on and one of the things was if the bulb were placed against something especially something that was grounded or, or at a different potential than the bulb they would start to get little uh, little marks on the glass and it would of course that would shade the bulb and that would put a shadow wherever that little shaded area would show up and uh, we, jumping ahead, that's it became known as the Edison effect because at the Edison bulbs was the first time that this type of thing was, you know, this effect was noticed uh, or uh, recognized. But uh, it didn't take long that a lot of people started, he, he kind of cast it off as a problem <laughs> and something that was just a, a nuisance. But others picked up where that left off and realized that there had to be something causing that. And what it was, was that we came later, way later to find that as this filament got very hot, it would give off, it would release free electrons or like make a cloud of electrons around that filament. And those electrons could be attracted to a positively charged area and they were actually causing the glass to discolor and little particles of the filament were getting uh, impregnated into the glass and causing that shade. 
So it didn't take long before people started really studying this effect. And eventually, we put another electrode inside this bulb, and we created the first vacuum tube, which was a diode. And an x-ray tube is really that early of a design of vacuum tube. It's very basic in that manner, in that it's only a diode. Now, what is a diode? Well, a diode is an is a electronic device, and there, there's all kinds. You know, a modern diode, of course, is a uh, made of silicon, and is very can be very tiny. So here's a diode <laughs> up against this diode. You can see there's a little bit of difference size difference in there. But really, what it does is it allows electrons to flow in one direction, but not the other, and in a vacuum tube, in the case of a vacuum tube, the electrons will flow from the negatively charged cathode to the positively charged anode. And that's what's happening. Now, in any vacuum tube, this is the case. Now, later on, vacuum tubes were perfected. This is actually two tubes in one package. And again, it's a diode, but there's actually two diodes in here. The anode is this gray metal part that you're looking at, and the cathode is the actual filament, that, and it's running up inside. You can't see it because it's hidden inside the anode. And there's a spacer between that filament and this anode. And so when we apply heat, just like in the light bulb to get that Edison effect, when we create heat, that heat will actually allow those electrons to more freely flow from the cathode to the anode when you put the charge on it on you know across the elements in the correct direction. Later on, other elements would be added to tubes like this one. Any of you uh, audio guys, this is a type 845 and it's a triode. It actually has a control grid situated between the anode and the cathode that allows you to apply a negative voltage, a smaller neg negative voltage to the, uh, to the grid and control the flow of current between the anode and the cathode. Um, yeah, this is an original RCA and it's out of a, uh, an, an RCA voice of the theater amplifier out of a old 1920s movie theater that, uh, a friend of mine and I carried about a 250 pound, six foot tall amplifier. <laughs> um, still have it in my storage unit. I'm going to mess with it one day, but just haven't gotten around to it. But anyways, every x-ray tube, we, we, call the, we call these thermonic valves because basically what's happening is by heating that filament, that, that thermal heat is actually creating that electron cloud that's allowing that flow of electrons more easily. The hotter we make that filament, the, the more electrons that are available to make that jump from anode to cathode. Now, one of the byproducts of this is whenever an electron is accelerated from the cathode to the anode, when it actually strikes the anode, a reaction takes place between that electron and between the metal anode that is positively charged. And in most instances, the reaction that takes place is there is a conversion of some of the energy from that electrical energy into heat energy. Um, the rest of it, about 99% of that conversion is heat energy when that happens. 1% though is something different and that something different is x-ray and we're going to talk a little bit more about what x-ray is here in a minute but again when that electron is accelerated from the cathode to the anode it strikes the anode it's either going to turn into heat or a reaction will take place that will knock off what we call a and create a photon between that electron and the metal target. And that photon is an x-ray photon. Now, in these smaller tubes, it really wasn't noticed very much because those photons were so weak and so unsubstantial that 
this metal of the of the anode would block that it would never pass through it and even if it could pass through that it couldn't pass through this glass bulb it wasn't until we started applying very high voltages between an anode and a cathode did we see the effects of x-ray radiation so the first type of x-ray tube um, and again was was a tube um, an early version was called the Crookes tube and it had what was called cold cathode emissions in other words they didn't have a filament it had a cathode and an anode and you just applied a very high voltage across it and even with no heat some of those electrons would break loose and make that jump from the cathode to the anode and very very small amounts of radiation uh, would be produced but th it was enough that it could be measured or it could be detected um, by scientists now one of the first people and and I say one of the first he's credited as the founder of x-ray but he was really one of the early people he's the first one to actually experiment very specifically with it and his name is Wilhelm Rankin and uh, most people have heard of you know of his of his name Rankin and uh, even even early uh, x-rays were called Rankin grams sometimes and he was a German physicist and in 1895 is when he really did the first serious study of this phenomenon and he discovered um, that that unknown energy that he referred to as an x-ray because it was something that was not known you couldn't see it and it had a property that light and, and other forms of energy did not have and that is it could pass through objects um, that were solid so for instance in this x-ray tube the radiate the x-rays that are produced from this tube pass right through the glass like it's not even there and this only happens when you're working with very high voltages now a lot of the early scientists and physicists who worked with this uh, really paid an ultimate price for this because they didn't realize the health effects of radiation this is very very dangerous to work with um, to this day it is a regulated medical device and unless you're tr properly trained and have a purpose for this you're really not allowed to work with radiation in any way shape or form at least in the United States so uh, yeah x-ray tubes are very dangerous you should not do this I'm doing this so you don't have to um, again read my disclaimer at the beginning of all my videos I warn you <laughs> uh, so anyways to move move further ahead this this tube is designed specifically to take advantage of that one percent of energy and that is you know again like I said it's a very inefficient system and from Wilhelm Rankin's day into, uh, into in 1895 clear till now today we really have not been able to improve on those numbers at all uh, this tube is a modern x-ray tube and it still can only convert about one percent of the energy expended inside that tube into usable x-ray radiation 99 percent is converted into heat and of course the heat does nothing but cause damage inside there we have to carry the heat away um, so that it doesn't um, overheat and damage the tube um, so much heat is produced in these that these targets can actually glow white hot um, when the tube is operating at full power um, now I have a couple of uh, images that I'll put up on the monitor hopefully when I edit the video I'll try to do it that way but uh, this tube would normally be mounted inside of what's called a housing and a housing is a metal case lined with lead and it holds the tube it has multiple purposes number one it holds the x-ray tube number two because it is metal and lead it's very dense and it blocks a lot of the x-ray so it acts as shielding the tube only has a small opening in the bottom 
and the tube would be situated like this under you know inside the housing and underneath the housing there'd be a hole right here and that's called the port and that's the area where the radiation can escape all the rest of it is covered with lead and steel and m most of it can mostly absorb all of the rest of the scattered radiation that's inside that housing the housing also is filled with dielectric oil um, now that oil that we use today is made by Shell Corporation. It's called Shell Diala. Um, it's kind of an inert oil. You, it's of course you don't want to drink it or anything, but it's not particularly dangerous like the old PCBs that we hear about from the past. Um, and it has a very high dielectric content, and that's very important because you have upwards of 150,000 volts potential in this tube in a little metal housing so you don't have very much distance so the oil is the only thing you have to insulate that very very high voltage from arcing to the metal housing and the metal housing of the tube is always tied to earth ground um, so the oil is an insulator the other thing the oil does is it's a very good conductor of heat so as we said we want to keep this tube from overheating and melting down so the oil actually will act as a heat sink to carry the heat from the insert to the housing and then the housing gets hot and it radiates that heat out into the open air some x-ray tubes the bigger ones like in cat scanners and things like that they even have oil circulating pumps and radiators and fans and all kinds of things to cool them even faster so uh, and w there were even tubes in the past that even had water chillers and had water jackets built into them and water circulated into the oil uh, through tubes and the water would carry the heat from the oil and then it would go through that chiller system and get chilled and then it, the heat would or the cold water would flow back into the tube and so forth so um so that's another thing the housing does the other thing the housing does is it houses the stator and yes x-ray tubes like this one actually have a motor inside of them so if you look this is your cathode as we said in video number one your cathode cup this is the anode this little this round disc and it is attached by the stem to this rotor so this is the rotor part of an AC squirrel cage motor okay and so by putting a stator winding it's just like a, a regular two pole or two, two pole uh, AC motor those windings th this goes right inside the windings and it creates a rotating magnetic field that will spin this rotor and the reason that we do that is to spread the heat across the whole surface area of this target of this anode so um, this is a smaller x-ray tube it's only got a three inch anode three inches long or diameter um, but they have four inch anodes and then when you get into cath labs and cat scanners you know they can be up to seven or eight inches in diameter huge massive um, the amount of heat that these can take is measured in what's called heat units and it's a mathematical calculation of the amount of energy of watt wattage of energy you're putting into the tube versus the amount of energy that it can dissipate um, so bigger tubes have higher heat unit capacity um, now this whole this whole assembly here is called the rotor so it's the anode but when you when you talk about the anode with the whole motor assembly we call this the rotor and the whole thing is being suspended by a little bearing here on the end here so figure how much weight this is this is a, over one to two kilograms of metal inside here just for this small tube the bigger ones get very heavy and all that force is on this little bearing here on the end so this is a very very high quality bearing and if you look at it when I turn the tube you could see the anode hardly even moves it's because this bearing is so perfectly balanced and so low friction and they're designed like that on purpose as I said in my first video it's not uncommon for the older versions of these um, when they were really well built 
to after you turned them off, turned the x-ray machine off, this thing would be coasting. This rotor could coast for up to an hour, and I've seen it happen. You know, we've been working on machines in the past, you know, back in the 1980s and so forth, and a, the tube would be running, and we'd shut the machine off, and the tube's coasting away, and we'd go to lunch, come back, and the tube's still coasting. Um, now, more modern ones, they don't use as good of a bearing assembly, nor do they use as good of a lubricant in the bearing. So even though they still coast a very long time, it's nothing like that anymore. <laughs> Nothing's as good as it used to be, you know. Don't build them like they used to, as they say. So that's what this is all about. That's, what this, that's why these tubes are shaped in this manner. Now, as we saw before, in video number one, there are two filaments or two cathodes. This is a dual cathode tube. Now why do you need two cathodes, you might ask? Well, the reason you need two cathodes is these two cathodes are two different sizes. And you once again have to understand the function of how a tube works. Whenever you heat that valve up, whenever you heat that filament, and then you apply that voltage between anode and cathode and that electron cloud starts to move towards the anode it will actually form a, a spot on this anode and we call that the focal spot that's what it's called and a lot of times we refer to our filament as our focus now there's a reason for that <laughs> remember x-rays are used to take pictures so a lot of the terminology we use may not be so much electronic terminology but it could also be photographic terminology that you would hear in photography. Um, the larger the filament the larger of a spot or larger of a focus it would put on that anode. Um, and what what happens is as the x-rays come out uh, you know of the tube the smallest object that you could define with this tube is the size of that focus, that little dot that it makes on that anode. And it's also a function of that and a function of this little chamfer angle that you see cut on the face of that anode. And again, this is way too much stuff to talk about in this little video, so I'm not going to get into that, but the larger focus is 1.2 millimeters and the small focus is a 0.6 millimeters and what that means is that doesn't mean that the filament is 1.2 millimeters long it means that it will put a 1.2 millimeter dot on that anode and the 0.6 will put a 0.6 millimeter 0 0.6 the trade-off is bigger filaments can create bigger energy and create more x-rays a larger quantity of x-rays coming out at the same time whereas a smaller filament even though it has a higher can make a more detailed image in an x-ray it can it because of its physical size handles less energy so that's the trade-off so we have both so when we're doing large anatomy like doing your torso or or your hip or something like that that takes a lot of energy for that x-ray to penetrate we use the large focus it has a little bit less resolution but it has the energy to expose the film in a short period of time. Whereas if I'm doing a hand or something delicate or small that, that is more detailed, small bones are harder to see, you, want, you don't need as much power, but you need more detail. So you use the small focus. And that's why the tubes have two focuses. Now I'll hook this up to uh, a power supply, and I'll show you what it looks like when it's lit up. Okay, I now have a power supply connected between the common lead and the large focus lead. And I'm going to move this out of the way here so that it doesn't get so much glare. And you can pretty clearly see that large focus here on the left. And if I turn up the power supply, you actually see it start to light up. Now, the brighter that I make this filament, the more electrons are going to be released in, in a cloud in that area. And 
the more freely they will jump, the more quantity. So adjusting the filament temperature adjusts the quantity of X-ray photons that are going to flow at any given point in time. So it increases the rate of those photons, how many of them flow at any given time. Okay, so that's what that does. Now, at the same time, and by the way, this is not making an X-ray, and I'm doing this on purpose so you understand how this works. There is a current flowing across that filament, and the filament is lighting up and it's giving off heat. But there is no energy between the cathode and the anode right now because I do not have any charge put between the two. In order for X-ray to happen, you need two voltages to happen. You need voltage to light up the filament to create the electron cloud. Then you need a potential difference between the anode and the cathode to allow those, those electrons to make that jump. The higher the voltage, the more you accelerate them, and the more energetic that photon will be. We call that quality. So there's two properties to an X-ray. Quantity, which is how many, and quality is how intense each of those photons is. Now, if I applied a low voltage between this cathode and anode, and by the way, let's turn this off. The positive lead, or the anode, goes on to a, a little terminal strip, terminal ring terminal that would screw into here. So that's your anode, and that's connected through the bearing, and that special grease is also conductive grease. Not only just is it a lubricant, but it's also a conductor. And it conducts that power all the way out to this target. So we put a positive charge here, and then we put a negative charge on this end, and you see this red wire. The common lead between the large focus and small focus, the, the other end of that, those two filaments are tied together here, we would put a negative voltage here with respect to this positive voltage. So x-ray machines use a differential power supply. So for instance, if I was going to put 40,000 volts across here, or 40 kV, I would only put a negative 20 kV with respect to ground on this side, and I would put positive 20 kV with respect to ground on this side, and the differential would be 40 kV. But with reference to ground, anywhere that you get in contact with the ground, it's half, so it would be 20 kV. We've, it's always been that way. Remember, we're working with very high voltages, and the, the higher the voltage, the harder it is to insulate. So making a cable that can carry a maximum of 60,000 volts or 75,000 volts is much easier than making a cable that can insulate 150,000 volts. And that's why we do it that way. It's safer that way, if you can believe that. <laughs> so anyways, we apply a heat and by increasing or decreasing the heat on the filament, we're increasing or decreasing the quantity of x-rays that's going to come out. And then by increasing or decreasing the voltage between the anode and cathode, we are increasing or decreasing the quality of the x-ray photons. And the quality is what determines how thick of an object that x-ray can penetrate through. Does that all make sense? Clear as mud, isn't it? <laughs> so, it took me a while to learn all this stuff over the years. So, that's essentially what's happening inside this x-ray tube. Now, the devices that control this we refer to as the x-ray generator. And the generator, as we saw on video one, I'm going to keep referring to that. So, if you didn't watch it, you want to watch that video. Um, has controls three factors. The MA, as we talked about, is actually an adjustment that controls the amount of filament heat. Now these filaments run maximum at about 12 volts, and if you apply 12 volts across this filament, uh, it'll draw somewhere in the line of about 7 
to 8 amps of current. Um, and we really don't care what the current or the voltage is on that filament. We only care what the total power in that filament being dissipated is because the power equals the heat. So there's different ways that we can control the voltage on that and the current and the power on that filament. The simplest way is just putting a big heavy resistor in series with the power supply for this filament. And each resist, you know, bigger resistor eats up more of the energy and allows less energy to the filament. You're just making a voltage divider. There are also electronic circuits, you know, like switched mode type power supplies and chopper power supplies and things that also perform the same function of controlling the energy to the filament. But that's what MA is all about. Controlling how much heat so that it controls the quantity of electrons moving from the filament to the anode. Okay, so that's what that is. Now, we also have the KV control. We call that KV because everything's in thousands of volts, remember? The very minimum amount of potential between here that will allow the first amount of radiation to pass through this tube is called its emissions point. Okay, so when we have filament emissions, that's when we actually start getting current flowing through this tube from the cathode to the anode. And that happens at about 40,000 volts in this particular tube. E every tube's different. Uh, bigger tubes have a higher minimum voltage. This one will actually start to make radiation and start to conduct at about 40 kV or 40,000 volts. And the maximum is how much potential you can put between anode and cathode before you draw an actual arc or an actual lightning bolt between there. And in this x-ray tube, it's approximately 125,000 volts. So I can apply 125,000 volt potential between this filament and this anode, and it will not arc, but it will still conduct like a diode, and it will make very strong, very powerful radiation. If I turn the filament up very hot to create a lot of free electrons, then I accelerate it at full power at 125 kV, I will make very intense radiation. Even though only 1% of the converted energy is radiation, it's still very intense radiation at that power. If it's making that much x-ray, 99% of it is heat. Imagine how much heat we're making. I've seen these anodes glow absolutely white hot before. Um, the, it can actually melt the glass. It can melt this. I've seen these anodes completely melt and see I've seen the bearing melt and seize up and freeze up and uh, the tube is destroyed. You have to get rid of it, <laughs> replace it. Um, so once again, that's what we're doing. The third factor that we saw on that generator console was time. So if we're controlling the quantity by adjusting the MA or the current, you know, we change the heat of the filament, so we change how many electrons jump from here to here. We also can affect it by how much time it's turned on. Of course, the more quantity of radiation is coming out, the less time that it needs to be on. So time and MA work together. So we factor those two together and call it mass, MA seconds or MAS. And it's nothing but the MA, the milliamps of current flowing from the cathode to the anode. Not the amps flowing through the filament, but the amps, milliamps of current flowing from the cathode to the anode. We multiply that by the number of seconds that the exposure is turned on and that equals our mass. And that gives us the total quantity of radiation. We measure it in mass. And again, we can change two things. We can either heat or cool the filament or turn the time up or down and any combination of the two. So really there are two functions, mass and KV and those two control the quantity and quality of the x-ray beam. That's how it works. And really, an x-ray machine, that's all its job is, 
It's a giant power, two, two power supplies with a timer on them. Uh, one power supply to drive the filament, and it's low voltage and high current, and one power supply to drive the high voltage, and it's very high voltage and low current. Okay, well, relatively low current, if you want to call 125,000 volts at 1 amp, because a lot of these will do up to 1,000 MA, or 1 amp. Yeah, that's 125 kilowatts, <laughs> for, for those of you counting. A lot of energy, guys, um, and the bigger tubes are even more powerful. So, you're messing with very, very high voltages. You're messing with radiation that is dangerous. Now let's talk about radiation a little bit. Radiation is useful if it is used, it's a good thing if it is used by professionals who are properly trained for the proper reasons. Radiation can be used to reduce or to cure or to control cancer like tumors. It can be used to look at the inside of your body. So if I think I may have a broken finger I can take an x-ray of my finger and I'm going to adjust the quality of the radiation by adjusting that KV so that those photons are powerful enough to pass through the soft tissue of my skin but not powerful enough to pass through the, the more dense bone. So that bone absorbs the radiation, the tissue passes it through and you see a shadow of those bones on the film or on whatever the receptor is, whether it's a digital detector or film or whatever. That's how x-rays work. You're really looking at a shadow. Um, if I turn the x-ray up too high, if I turn that KV up too high, it'll pass through everything and I'll just get a completely blacked out film. If I turn it too low, it won't pass through anything and you'll just see a big shadow shaped like my hand and no bones. So really it's a balancing act and that's what the, your uh, x-ray technician, that's their job, is to set the controls and to understand the anatomy so that they can get that perfect balance and get that perfect image. So it's kind of like photography. They're actually x-ray photographers. That's what they are. And our job is to maintain these machines so that they function properly and uh, so that they output the amount of radiation that they think that they're getting, <laughs> that they're trying to get. All right, one last thing I'm going to do before I wrap up this video. Like I said, I didn't want to get too deep into it. Just a little bit of theory of how these work. Um, I'm going to do one last thing that's a little more advanced, and we're going to talk a little bit about why this machine that this came off of came out of service and why it's not being reused or reinstalled somewhere else. And the reason for that is there have been some advances in X-ray and really it's with how we are how those power supplies work especially the kv think about it an x-ray is always less than one second sometimes it's just a couple of milliseconds or a couple thousandths of a second is all the time that this x-ray needs to be on in order to expose the image receptor whether it be film or whether it be a digital detector or whatever and so being able to turn a hundred thousand volts on and off very rapidly and it has to be a square wave on and off it can't be a slope it has to be square wave on and off and uh, in order to do that it it's very complicated you can't just use a relay or something with that kind of voltage so there's a lot of different tricks that we have to do to to get that to work now in the old machines we controlled we had a transformer that would step the voltage up very very high <laughs> and instead of switching the high voltage we would switch the primary to that transformer and of course you had transformer lag and you had all kinds of things to deal with but you could control it very very quickly that way the problem is when you you couldn't put a capacitor to filter the, the power supply in other words it wasn't pure DC that was going through these tubes, but it was a pulsed AC. It wasn't AC, but it was pulsed DC. In other words, it was unfiltered. It had the full ripple. And we know that whenever we use a half-wave bridge rectifier, 
you're going to get 60 little pulses every second, okay, or 60 half cycles. And if you used a full wave bridge rectifier, you would get 120 pulses per second. And those pulses would go all the way from zero volts to the maximum, to the peak voltage and back down. Um, now think about that for a second. Let me write something down and maybe you'll understand. If, if my voltage is doing this, this is a full wave rectified uh, signal, right? So we're taking a sine, sine wave and we're rectifying it full wave. You're actually getting 120 of these pulses every second, right? And each one of these is just a half of a sine wave, right? So it's really kind of like that. You know, they're, they're not really close together like that. They actually they ramp down and ramp up. It's a sinusoidal waveform. Well, remember I said just a minute ago that I need a balance of just enough x-ray to penetrate the skin, but not enough to penetrate the bone so that the bone absorbs the radiation and the skin passes it through. Well, that's only in a very narrow range of that kV. So let's say I needed 60 kV to see my hand, okay? 60,000 volts. And down here is zero, right? So we have zero kV here. Well, only about this much of that waveform is actually x-raying my hand. The rest of this down here, while it's building up and while it's decaying back down, this whole part under here, all of this, guess what? It's still x-ray, however, it's not doing anything to, to make an image on the film. It's all being absorbed by my tissue. So I'm actually radiating my skin for no reason for down here. Now in the perfect world, what we would want is our x-ray to go up, across, and down to be a straight DC. But Again, if I put it, you might say, what if you put a great big 60 kV capacitor here to fill in the gap? Well, the problem with the capacitor is capacitors charge and capacitors discharge. When I shut this off, remember, we could be taking a 120th of a second, you know, or even like a, let's say, a 1 millisecond, 0 0.001 second exposure. That capacitor to filter this out would take longer than 1 millisecond to discharge into the x-ray tube. So you would actually again get a longer exposure than what you want and therefore you would overexpose the patient. Um, so once again you can't have anything on this output. Old x-ray machines like this one used to be have this. This is what how they work. 120 pulses per second and there's a large percentage of it that isn't being used, okay? So that was not a very efficient system. Modern x-ray machines today, using very, very high frequencies, you know, RF level frequencies, can actually achieve this. The actual wire that, that carries the high voltage to the x-ray tube, just a tiny, teeny little bit of capacitance in that is all you need at those super high frequencies to flatten this out. Yet the discharge on those wires is so small that you get a pretty much square waveform. So all the x-ray machines coming out today are now working this way. Nobody is ever going to use this anymore because it's not efficient. Uh, this used to be very very expensive. Um, the, the high voltage devices that you needed to switch things like this weren't good enough yet, um, really until the, the mid-1990s or the early 1990s did it really start getting to where it was, you could really practically use that. So uh, this was a phased out machine, so it was time for it to be retired, and that's why we don't use them anymore. 
there's still quite a few of them out there and the ones that are out there will continue to be used until they go out of service and no it's not going to kill you I don't want to cause fear among everybody uh, we've been using this type of of a system for a hundred years and we've all lived through it <laughs> but the idea with radiation is you want to expose the patient to the very very least amount as possible um, understand something about x-ray and again I'm not trying to incite fear but you have to know reality um, one x-ray photon interacting with one cell in your body has a very very small but a very real potential to mutate that cell and a mutated cell is what can turn into cancer or other diseases like that or a radiation burn or any other thing so really we want to minimize that to the very minimum um, the less radiation we have to be exposed to the better it's kinda like putting sunscreen on you know it's it's not gonna kill you to go out on a sunny day but it's not good for you to be in it every single day and not wear sunscreen if you're going to be out in direct sunlight all day every day so we minimize it by putting on sunscreen and this is the same principle you know we're gonna turn it on it's all doing work exposing the film for only as long as it needs to to get the perfect picture and then shutting off totally none of the x-ray is wasted on exposing your skin and doing no work so that's the reason that this x-ray machine came out of uh, service so again uh, probably confused a lot of you even more and you'll have a gazillion questions and that's okay feel free to ask any in the comments section I'll try to answer them if I have time here um, but for right now I think that's enough there's a lot more to know about a tube um, you know space charge compensation and all these different things uh, you know these targets can be made of different materials like this one right now is made of tungsten but some of these are made of molybdenum some of them are made of rhodium some of them are made of a combination of metals each one creates different x-ray photons that have different properties that react different ways with different tissues so like a mammography machine that's used for uh, imaging breast images will use either a rhodium or a molybdenum or sometimes a tungsten rhodium combination target and because of the type of radiation it produces um, also the breast imaging is done at low kV anywhere from 23 kV up to anywhere around 28 kV or so uh, most most of them are 25 to 26 kV and the tubes are smaller they're physically smaller they have a little smaller target they have a shorter gap between the anode and the cathode um, they're designed for that particular purpose so there's a lot to know about this stuff but uh, this is at least enough to give you guys an idea I know when you when I used to go into an x-ray machine to you know get an x-ray I always wondered what was going on in the background so now you know and uh, I hope uh, hope I wasn't too confusing I did this off the cuff I have a whole ton of work uh, coming up and really didn't have time to do a fancy you know prepare anything in a fancy way or anything so hopefully this was enough to uh, give you a little understanding and uh, you know maybe uh, who knows maybe one day uh, some of you youngsters out there will get into this very few people left out there that do what we do um, to this level it's getting harder and harder to find guys that work on this type of equipment because of how much training you need and so forth but anyways thank you all for watching I hope this was at least interesting and not too boring to you all it's definitely has interested me for the last 30 years I'm still fascinated with it to this day and I just wanted to share my career with you guys and see give you an idea of what I do take care everybody and uh, be well peace joy happiness and good health in your lives and uh, hopefully if the health is not so good uh, we'll be giving you the whatever you need so that we can find out how to make you healthy so with that take care everybody bye bye